Well, guys, I'm excited to be here at uh, NBC today. And um, on, uh, on Father's Day, I'm the proud father of, of two beautiful girls. And uh, it's just uh, a joy um, to have them in my life and to, to be able to, to just speak into their lives and, and watch them grow up. And, and it's a pretty incredible thing. So um, we've, uh, as, if you flash back to way back in the year of our Lord, 2013, on this very day, uh, it was a very different, you would have met a very, very different Michael Matthews. It was a very kind of a somber, sad day for me because <clears throat> on that day I was in Maine State Prison. And I had no problem going back to any of you boys. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I, we were doing some prison ministry um, there uh, with, uh, with the Brothers Corley, with the guys here. And, and, uh, and we were inside this big maximum security uh, prison that day. It was a sad day for me for many reasons. Number one, I wasn't with my dad. I wasn't able to just uh, give him a big hug and say, Dad, I love you. Um, and then I wasn't with my girls. And they were crazy, busy that day. You, and for some reason, they want you to have phones in prison. I don't, I don't know what's up with that. Uh, I can't take selfies in prison. It's just, that's, a, that's a quote. Somebody write that down. That's one, one good reason for this young generation to not go to prison. You can't take selfies there, teenagers. Stay, stay out of jail. But, you, but so I didn't get to talk to them. And, and then I was surrounded by hundreds of guys that came out to, to, uh, to come to the show. And, and uh, I love them because they were a captive audience. Amen. <laughs> it's like they can't, get ti- they, they, they can't get tired of us and leave. <laughs> I'm going back to maximum security. Put me back in the hole. This guy does not know how to play guitar. But I was there amongst all those guys. And... And I can remember uh, talking to those guys, and I just hadn't seen my kids in, by that time, like three weeks or something like that when we were on tour up there. And, and some of the guys there hadn't seen their kids in years. And, man, they were just tear- these big, burly guys, face tattoos, very frightening, <laughs> were tearing up. And some of them like, I think my son is like 19, 18, 19. You know, didn't know exactly how old they were or what they were doing even. And they were so, so sad that, you know, they had gotten impl- themselves in this position. And, and then on Father's Day, they couldn't be um, with their kids. <clears throat> so we got out of the, we got out of the, the, the prison. They, they let Stephen out that time. <laughs> and uh, they were going to do something special for us. And they decided to do this really cool um, demonstration with their police dog. This German Shepherd, he was, I don't know, made somewhere between here and there, that tall monster canine, and, and they had the guy dressed up in a big, you know, outfit that looks like, I don't know, like a giant Teletubby, and, and, he's, and they, they're getting him to attack this guy, and it's so cool. In the middle of that, I had my phone, and I get a call from one of my girls, and I think it may have been Kayla, and like in the midst of this, this cool thing that I've always wanted to see, because I love dogs, and I love when, I don't know, the show, dog, when dogs attack, animals attack, I'm there. <laughs> and in that moment, that wasn't the coolest thing around anymore. The coolest thing around was I was getting a call that said, Kayla Matthews, heart emoji, kissy emoji, thumbs up, thumbs up, blue heart, yellow heart. That's, that's, that's Kayla. <laughs> and so I just ran, and I, and I, opened my, and I, and I answered my phone and, and, and got to talk to my family for a while. And that, that Father's Day picked up just hearing their, hearing their voices. And then later on, I get to talk to my dad and stuff. But Father's Day is a, is a, is a huge deal for me. It's a huge deal for me as a Christian, too, so I'm just thankful, again, that, that for the faithfulness of the fathers in our lives. Whether it's a father, a father figure, a grandfather, somebody who took time up with you, uh, a, a man who showed some sort of strength in your life, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible. And um, to have a, that faithful partner, that faithful father in your life, is just absolutely um, necessary for men and women to grow up into who they need to be. So this morning's message is about being faithful. And, oh yeah, there it is. Came up with that myself. All right, faithful. And the Bible defines faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. We're going to be there, and we're going to be in James today a little bit, and Psalms just a little bit, and Psalm 119. But for right now, we're in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. <clears throat> And some of you will know this, this 
simple verse, and, and it says, Now faith is a, is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That little simple, that simple sentence there, he's summing up what faith is. And it's not, a, it's not just a feeling that you have, there's a God. It's not that person that you talk to and say, well, I know there's a God out there somewhere. There's a creator. I believe that. That's not faith. It's not a, it's not a choice you make hoping it was the right choice. It's not, you know, I'm going to put all my cards in here on, on Jesus, and I hope this is my right decision. That's not faith. It's not just a hope, and I love this. It's not just a hope that one day we'll experience God and we'll meet God and we'll be taking in, taken into God's kingdom. That first part of that verse says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is more than hope, it's substance. It's right now. It's experiencing God right now and getting a taste for who he is and how much he loves you and what it's going to be like to actually be with him. Faith is going to God in prayer in our darkest moments, in our highest highs, on our average day, and experiencing as much of him as we can right now. See, faith is not far away. This year, if, if, if uh, Pam keeps on track and hangs with me, uh, in, in another eight months, we will have been married for 25 years. Yeah, that's a, that's a big deal, right? Okay, I didn't think it was just me. It's a big deal. And uh, so far, so good, okay? I think she still likes me. So this year, I decided... All right, this girl's been with me for this long, and we've been together for like 27 years now, all together dating and, and all since we're 18. And um, so if you're doing the math, 30. Um, we've been together for this long, and I've always wanted to do something big when we hit 25. So it's like, okay, it's time to upgrade that wedding set. Put some more bling on that finger, right? All right, so... We go, and she picks out this beautiful ring. I mean, it is stunning, and it is just so big. It's, it's just it's breathtaking. And she pulls it out, and she puts it on, and, and it's just incredible. She's like, this is the one. And I'm like, no, it's too expensive. <laughs> and then she found this one that was okay. And if you get it under just the right light, it's, it's, it's neat. And then I put, no, it was, it's a beautiful ring. And, and so here's the deal now. Michael Matthews does not have the money, and if they were taking checks, maybe. But I did not have the money, the cash money on hand, to turn and lose of and walk away with that, with that ring. Not at all. So they had this little layaway thing, and I can come in. We've been doing business with God. Did we buy our original set from him? or you know, We've been doing business with him for a long time, so they just come in and pay it as you can. It's like, hell, oh, great. You know, maybe between now and that 25th anniversary, we, you know, we can always, we only hope. So, so the only thing we walked out of there with is like a picture, you know, that she took of. <laughs> it's the only time that camera's been on the away facing mode because you know it's not not selfie, just the just the ring. That's all. That's all she has is that is that picture. There's, there's nothing. There's nothing tangible. He didn't say, well, just keep paying here. Here it is. Just pay me when you can. Some of you faith that way. Like one day, if I keep working hard enough, I'm going to experience this wonderful thing. I'm going to experience God. I'm going to experience who he is. I'm going to experience his greatness and his glory and his wonder. And guys, we sell ourselves so short because that is not faith. That's not true hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That word substance, it's, it's, it's material. You can touch it, you can feel it, you can take it, you can use it, you can experience it. It's the substance of things hoped for. Faith is one day I'm going to be in, in, the, in the spiritual and the physical embrace of my Savior. But right now, I'm feeling his presence all around me and through me and inside of me. And he uses me and he speaks to me through his word. And he shapes me. And he orders my days. That's faith. It's the substance 
of things hoped for. And it's the, it's the evidence of things not seen. When God comes into our life, it's evident that he, that he forgives us for our sins. And he changes us and he makes us new. It's evident to us and it should be evident to others. Sometimes the best evidence of who God is to others that will never open a Bible is to see you living out your faith. Amen? Amen. It's to see you simply living out what God is pouring into you. And that's where we get to what true faith is and what it takes. Is he pouring into you? Are you allowing him to pour into you? We need, to be, we need people who are faithful to the call, who are faithful in the journey, who are faithful in growing, in serving, in loving, in reaching. If we're up and down, we're not faithful. I think we have a better grasp sometimes of what it means to be faithful than the actual word faith, which is, which is kind of funny to me. I've been thinking about this and talking to people about it. Faith is kind of this mysterious, or even when you read that scripture, people don't quite understand what you mean, but the average person knows what you mean when you say faithful. When you ask my wife, is her husband faithful, she knows exactly what she means, that you mean, and she knows exactly the answer that she's going to say. If someone asks, is my kids, is your father involved in your life? Is he provide for you? Is he faithful? Most of them, you know, probably sometimes they say, yeah, I wish he wasn't so faithful. Like too nosy. But they know exactly what you mean to be faithful. I, I run a business, and I know what it means to have a faithful employee that's going to be there on time, and it's going to give me everything that he has from the time we get on the job until the time we leave. I know what it's like. I know what it looks like to have a faithful employee. We know what it looks like to have a faithful friend. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Simply because we know what it's like to have fair weather friends. Yeah. To have friends that, you know, you, you're in the deepest need in your life and they're nowhere to be found. We know what, we know what faithful means, but somehow we don't, we don't just go back to that root of that word and apply that to what faith really is. Faithful is the farmer who gets up at 3 a.m. and eats a breakfast and feeds his animals daily. I, well, not even daily, it's dark. You can't even call it daily. Duskly, you know. It's, it's, it's that guy that gets up there and faithfully, those chickens are not going to make eggs and they're not going to be taken care of. Those cows are not going to produce milk or, or whatever. And, and I have to do this every day. Guess what? He can't wake up Thursday and say, yeah, I don't feel like it. I don't, I don't feel like getting up and feeding those animals today. They're trying to fend for themselves. Hopefully they'll just be able to not open that barn door and get some hay themselves or something. That's a, that's a good picture of what faithful is. Faithful is that caregiver who attends someone who's sick and dying. And they're faithful. Some of you have been in that position with a parent or a loved one. And you're never away from their side. That's, that's, that's faith, and that's being, being faithful to someone. It's not just waking up one day and saying, look, you're going to take care of yourself right now. I need some me time. It's time to get my nails did. You know, here's your medicine. You know, here's the bedpan. I'm, I'm you know, just let me have me today. I need, you know, that's, Faithful is that caregiver that is just right there till the end, or right there till you get better. Faithful is the employee that shows up to the job early and is ready to do what's asked of him or her all, all day long and works to the best of their ability every day. Turn with me to the book of James, if you will. We're going to talk about a few things about faith, and, and hopefully by the, the end of this message, we're going to see the benefit and the idea of, of what it means to be full of faith, to really, truly be faithful in all that we do, in our families, in our lives, in our businesses, our work, our spiritual walk. I'm excited about the move that we're making in a few weeks, and it's going to give us some time to stretch our legs and, and just, you know, and arms and everything else, just reach out and, and, and not walk over people, and we're going to be able to put more and more people who need to hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ but I think, and I know this, it's not going to be because we have a bigger building. 
are really nice people who are allowing us to just take over this, 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 this great facility. It's not going to be because we make things look really cool and trendy or hip or relevant. Those things are fun things. We like, you know, atmosphere and, 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 and people can walk in and feel at home. We like all those things. It's not going to be because Brandy is brewing the best pot of coffee in Rankin County, which she will be bright and early, get there at 10 o'clock, right? Those are things that are, that are good and, 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 and even necessary. Guys, it's going to be because you guys are faithful. Okay? It's going to be because you, stay, you stand up today and say, I'm done with these same old struggles in my life that I've been fighting for for years. I'm done being a victim. I'm done struggling with this sin. I'm done struggling with my own insecurities. I'm done saying I can't do this. I can't lead someone to Christ or share a testimony or lead a prayer or lead a small group or allow our, our, our pastor and staff to, to disciple me so that I can be a leader. It's going to take each of you saying those things and stepping up. That's how church grows. Having a cool pastor, which we do, is not going to grow a church. Tim could spend all day, every day, just going knocking on doors and visiting people, and you guys would still do a better job than we would of actually reaching people for Christ. You work with them. You live with them. You shop with them. It's going to take us all of us doing that. In James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, I love this. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. And he's, he's not going to beat you up for asking. You ever had that buddy in school that you're a little light on lunch, you needed like 50 cents, and he, he, had, like he had to mortgage his house to come out with those two quarters? God's not that guy. And it will be given. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. First of all, this morning, I want you guys to know that there's no place and there's no time for a half faith, a half in and half out kind of faith. The Bible says you're double-minded. You're tossed around. You don't know which way is up, which way is down. He wants a complete commitment. He wants faithful followers. Psalm 119 will be there a couple of times this morning. Verses 113 through 120, uh, he starts and says, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, evildoers that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live. And let me not be put to shame in my hope. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. You spurn all who go astray from your statutes, for their cunning is in vain. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. David was never a guy who was half in and half out of that relationship with God. And in this moment, there's these, these words are not the words of a believer who's like, God, I love some of your parts of your word. They're really cool and uplifting. I like putting them on Facebook and Instagram. I like taking selfies and putting a little scripture underneath it that's hopeful and happy. He says, my flesh trembles for fear of you, and I'm afraid of your judgments. I have a deep fear, a deep respect, a deep love, and admiration. I don't ever want to get this far away from your word. I want to be found in you. 
And that's what James is saying when he says right there in, in, in verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Blessed, blessed is the believer when they get under trial that they continue to hold to the word of God. They don't change what they're doing. They don't say, this is not working, I'm going to try it my way. Amen? Anybody ever been there before? Yep. I'm raising both hands. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Bless the one who stays the course. Not half in, not half out. Not just a Christian on Sunday. Not just a Christian most of the year. There's many times I've been disappointed with myself and, and, and then my, my, my own actions or my own faith and, 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 in, and in others, Lord, who, who, who it seems like they can turn a switch on and off with their faith. Let them get far enough away from the church and they just go wild. Let them get away from their families and, and they say, okay, you know, it's time, it's, it's me time. It's time to let my hair down. It's time, well, not me, but, you know. It's, it's time, you know, this is, this is my time. I'll go back to my faith. It's like they pick it up and, and like, it's a, like it's a coat that they can wear and put off. And God's word says there's no time for this half in and half out. Secondly, in the scripture in James, uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, he says again, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt, be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then the desire, has, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and when sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own, he, will be, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. Can I tell you, church, secondly, there's no room, and we should have no time for a weak faith. We just have no time for a, a weak faith that gives in to every temptation that comes. If you're giving in to every temptation that comes, you're not in the Word enough. You're not rooting yourself in Him. Over and over and over and over again in Scripture, we see this idea of being rooted, being like a tree. Back in, back in the Old Testament, like a tree planted by the waters, growing up, giving a place for birds and creatures and everybody to come and enjoy and giving oxygen and giving life to this world. He talks about the different kind of seed in a parable. If we're not rooted in him, rooted in his word, not rooted in our idea of who he is, people, we have no time for a, a weak faith. You know what a weak faith is? Putting trust in Republicans. You know what a weak faith is? Putting trust in Democrats. Independents, socialists, anybody that's going to try to dictate your life. It's a weak faith. Putting trust in Obama, putting trust in Trump. I'm tell you, there were no angels rejoicing when either of those won an election. It doesn't make a difference either way. Okay? If you get mad, check where your faith is. We can't put our faith there. And there could be some decent guys in, in, in office and people who have really driven America and pushed us forward and done some cool things. But mostly I feel like we could do better. Anyway, side note. <laughs> Always. But that's, not, that's not where our faith needs to be. Wow, that is some shifting sand right there. Our faith can't simply be... My faith can't simply be in, 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 in my wife to uphold me and uplift me and encourage me and speak into me. and do, That's too much work for her. That's really too much work for any man to do, any person on this earth to really do for me. Amen? Amen. It's, that's, that's too much to ask of her. God says it's too much to ask of your, your wives. 
Maybe it's too much to ask for your spouse. It's too much to ask for your parents and your children to be that one that gives you faith and that one that lifts you up. It's a weak faith. And people let you down. I will let you down. Sometimes you will call me and my phone will be on vibrate. Or I'll forget that we were supposed to meet. Some of you here have experienced that. Sorrows, trials, violence, injustice, all increased, increase genuine faith. If you're experiencing trouble and trial in your life and your faith is, is, is demolished, great, that's a good place to start because it wasn't real. It wasn't built on the rock. It wasn't built in the word. If your faith is crushed and leveled and blown away by tragedy, the Bible very clearly calls that building your house on the sinking sand. Because I'm telling you today, when we build our house on the rock, when we plant ourselves in him, and guys, I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm going to tell you it is. Being a Christian is the most difficult thing you'll ever do. And it's tough. And it may not even be rewarding in this life. You may never have a new car. You may never have a new house. You may be homeless. You may have to go to a really mosquito-infested foreign country like northeast Alabama, where we just got back from this week. Where we're, me and the guys were leading worship there. So I don't want to be guilty of painting any kind of rosy picture about, hey, if you build your faith on sinking sand, that's awful. If you build your faith on the rock, it's always going to be great. It's always going to be wonderful. It's always going to be just incredibly, everything's going to be perfect. All the bills are going to get paid on time, everything like that. Psalm 119 says, your word, um, in, in verse 105 through 112. You've got to be really specific there because there's like 900 verses in that one chapter. And we need every one of them. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I've sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I'm severely afflicted. No prosperity gospel here. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my freewill offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. This was a man who faced real enemies, not just these, like, you know, these imagined things that we have in our lives. Can we talk about something real quick? NBC? It's a little side note again, a little side adventure. If you have a flat tire on your way to work, there was not a guy in a red suit with a pitchfork that did that to you. <laughs> Satan's got bigger things to do than make you a little late for work. You know, is this persecution? No, it is not persecution. If you, if you can't get your hair right in the morning, ladies, nipper. It, that's, 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 that's not Satan slowing you down. If you're having trouble meeting your bills, hey, man, we need to be more wise with our finances. We shouldn't have, picked it, we shouldn't have gotten that nice new whatever or upgraded our satellite package to the 3,000 channels. Come on. Man, we do, we do enough to ourselves without blaming him. He's good at what he does, but we do plenty on our own. He says, I'm severely afflicted. I hold my life in my hand continually. I'm in fear of my life continually. But it doesn't change me following your word. He says, when the wicked have laid a snare for me, but I don't forget your precepts. Some of us, when our enemies come, we want to throw hands. We know how to do that. I'm not saying if a guy tries to you know, jack your car, you shouldn't just, you know, knock him out. Okay? But it's a whole different matter. When my enemies come, I'm not going to lie and be cunning and, and wicked like they are and get on their level. I'm not going to forget who you are. 
I'm not going to forget to love my enemies. I incline my heart. I bend my heart. I open my heart. I take the satellite of my heart and point it in the perfect direction, like that blessed direct TV guy that comes out when your satellite is messed up and you can't watch NASCAR. And he, and he, and he, and he points it at, you know what, at just the right spot, right? Because I'll get out there, I'm like, okay. Pam's like, I'm going to call the satellite guy. The storm knocked out. I'm like, I got this. Like, I'm going to hold the satellite. You tell me when I've got it, you know. And I never, I never land it at all. I get like one Japanese game show thing going on. I don't, I don't even have that channel. He says, I incline my heart to this perfect place to receive for you. I open up this funnel and I, and I put it you know, up so you can pour into me. I incline my heart to you. We can't have, and there's no time for a weak faith. Thirdly, there's no time for a disobedient faith. In James chapter 1, back there again, uh, verses, verse 19 through 25, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once he forgets what he looks like. The older you get, the more you want to be that guy. (laughs) But the one who looks into the perfect law, And looks deeply into it. The law of liberty. And perseveres. Keeps digging. Keeps reading. Keeps obeying. Keeps following. Being no hearer who forgets. But a doer who acts. Faith is never a passive word. Faith is not something you have. It's not a trophy on your shelf. It's not a commendation. It's not a medal. being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. He will be blessed in everything he does. There's no time for a disobedient faith that says, yeah, pastor, I hear what you're saying, but I'm just going to do something else entirely or do something close to that. You don't understand. This person really needs to be punched right in the nose. Okay, good. There's a few people who've actually prayed that prayer, right? And had that conversation with their pastor. You don't understand. This is this is what I live with. This is this is what's going on. This, you know, I, I can't do that. This and guess what? There's not a marquee on this thing. It doesn't. It's not changing. There's no version that you can go to on your smartphone and update it and where it changes words. Well, actually there is, but do not use any of those Bible versions at all. It never changes. That God doesn't send updates, and I'm so thankful because guess what? There's no shadow of turning in him. There's no change. There's no dark spot that around the corner that we go, ah, there's who the real God is. He's, he's, he's all this and that. There's nothing that he hides from us. There's plenty that we don't understand about him because our gray matter is way too small. And we're confined to this one spot. And finally, there's no time for a passive faith. All throughout Scripture, there's a very clear idea that faith is active. It's not passive. It's not quiet. It's not, it's not hidden. It's not a hidden expression of our belief in God. It's expressive. It's growing. It's bright. It's attractive. It seeks to give God glory, to love others, to selflessly give, to do be not hearers of the word, but doers. Real faith is what God gives us to face every challenge, whether we are delivered or not. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 38. It says, and what more shall I say? And I love this scripture because in Hebrews chapter 11 is this cool faith chapter. 
And he's all like, Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham's so great. Abraham had all this faith and did this and a, and a few other really prominent faithful people. And we really stick with that one part, that first half, that first two-thirds of, of that verse. But I love, I think I love this last part even better. He says, um, what more shall I say? For time would fail me. So in other words, he says, I don't have enough time to tell you about Gideon, about Barak, about Samson, about Jephthah, of David and Samuel and all the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced <coughs> justice. It's a lost word today. Obtained promises. Stopped the mouths of lions. Quenched the power of fire. Sounded really cool so far. Everybody's on board with this. Escaped the edge of the sword. That's the best part of the sword to be at. <coughs> like the back end, getting away from it. Were made strong out of weakness. Love this. Became mighty in war. Who doesn't want to be a warrior? Put foreign armies to flight. Get out of here. R run away from God's army. Love it. Women received back their dead by resurrection. So cool. I'm right there with you. Oh, what's this? Some were tortured. How's that? How's that successful? How'd that get here? The, the, you know, did the wind blow a couple pages over? Nope. It says it right here. Some were tortured. Refusing to accept release. Like, nah, I'm not leaving your jail. You can keep torturing me because I'm going to keep following Christ. That's faith. So that, so that they might rise again to a better life. And we're so tied to this life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, <laughs> destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves and of earth. I want you to hear that last part and, and, and know. We talked about Abraham and how awesome he was, Father Abraham. All of these people. But he gets down to these last ones that were stabbed and killed and sawn in half and beat and flogged and refused, when the prison gates were open, and refused to walk out because they were still praising God and God wasn't done with them. He said... This world is not good enough for those people of whom the world was not worthy for these sufferers. These are the people that God highlights. Sure, Abraham gets like the first part of the verse and, and all this, and it was great things going on. But all these unnamed people are the ones who said, God says, you have been faithful. <laughs> This world is not worthy of, of, of you and of your godliness and of your relationship with me. There's no time for a passive faith, and there's no such thing as a passive, quiet, weak faith. Church, and we need you guys. I'm so excited about what God's stirring up in my heart and my life and in my family and in our pastor and his family and his heart and, and other leaders and other people, will you be faithful to his call? Will you come when God says come? Will you be faithful to lift up your neighbor in prayer? Will you be faithful to walk over and tap on that door and say, hey, I'm buying you coffee and donuts this week. We're going to church. That's kind of a fun way of saying it because it's free. Anyway, will you be a faithful employee at the job you hate? You start getting rooted in the Word and showing up to that job like you like it. And people start looking. People start paying attention. You'd be faithful in your home to love your children, your wife, 
your friends. We'd be faithful to support your, your, your pastor and staff and love them and lift them up and follow them as, as God leads them. We need to be faithful in our walk with Christ. Maybe, maybe today you've been out of, out of the Word. Maybe you haven't picked up that Bible since last Sunday. And we can't have that. Can't. It's not going to fly. Can't do it. Not me, not me telling you. It's God. You just can't do it. Be grounded. Be rooted. Because guess what? Trouble's going to come every day, whether you're in the Word or not. <coughs> Temptation's going to come really regular every day. Chances to hate are going to come daily, sometimes hourly, right? Those things aren't going to stop. Car's going to break, house's going to get a leak, tree's going to fall on it. Relationships get strained. That, that's a daily part of life. We, we miss the boat when we don't make God's word our daily part of our lives. And we find ourselves rooted there. This morning as the band comes and, and, and uh, we uh, begin to, to worship, maybe you need to just cry out to God. Say, God, this is, this is the area of my life where I've been faithless. This is the area of my life where I need you so much more. This is where I failed you. I've been off and on, cold and hot. And today I want to be faithful. Whether it's a sin, whether it's laziness, whether it's brokenness, whatever's in your way, will you just come and, 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 and cry out to him today? And your, our, our pastor to pray for you. Brother Wayne, uh, man, just, just make things right with God today. Let's sing. Will you stand?
was bought with in the precious blood of Jesus Christ.